Good morning, my brothers and sisters. This is another blessed day in the Lord. And I'm so glad that we are here together. We are here because God made this day and he assembled us here. Before we were formed in our mother's womb, God knew the day we were born that we would be here on this day, October, amen, 28, 2000. And twenty, so that's a that's a truly a blessing. Let us begin today uh, with scripture and followed by prayer. James three, verses one through five a, it reads: Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for we all stumble in many ways and if anyone does not stumble in what he says he is a perfect man able also to bridle his whole body if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us we guide their whole bodies as well look at the ships also though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the wheel of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. This is the word of God to the people of God. Let us pray. Father, now in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. We just lift up Jesus because Jesus informed us that if he be lifted up, he will draw all men to him. And Father, we thank you. We thank you in, for this present pandemic because it is showing us your awesome power. We are in very uncertain times, but we know that you have disciplined us, Father, to not look at what's going on around us, but, but that we will direct our eyes to the hills from where all of our help come. All of our help, Father, comes from you who made this heaven and earth. And we just said thank you right now. We ask you to bless our bodies, bless our minds, bless our souls, and prepare us right now to receive this word that you have spoken and pen yourself. And that we walk in a newness of life, that we could go out and tell somebody that Jesus Christ is alive and well. Bless us right now in Jesus' name. Amen. And thank you, Lord. Today, 
God has launched us into a, another study coming from the book and epistle of James, Jesus' half-brother. And today we are talking about taming your tongue, part one, which means there will be a part two. But today we're going to talk about taming your tongue. And it comes from the book of James. Amen. It comes from the book of James. Uh, three. Verses one through five. A. Hey. First of all, in Taylor tongue, we must use our tongues unselfishly. Number two, we must use our tongues carefully. And three, we must use our tongues beneficially. So today, we're going to talk about taming your tongue. Are you taming your tongue? Are you using your tongue? Amen. Usefully, are you using your tongue to bless somebody? Are you using your tongue carefully? Are you careful about what you say? Are you using your tongue to benefit somebody to make somebody's day better saying good morning how you doing i love you so today we're going to talk about taming your tongue have you taken time lately and have you thought about or given thought about your tongue about that little muscle that slab of muscle that's behind your teeth between your teeth and inside of your mouth, you see that tongue serves many benefits. Uh, you can chew. The tongue has the taste buds and glands all around the tongue that help to break down your food when you eat it. Amen. Your tongue enables you to talk. Your tongue is, assists you in swallowing your food when you have chewed it up. However, our tongues can be both helpful and they can also, our tongues can be also harmful in what we say and how we say it. You know, should you get up at night to go get you a drink of water and, and you are not aware of something on the floor and you trip over it and stumble over it and you know you're not around the past, you're not around church members and you might say that little word that nobody of us could hear and see that tongue is used in the wrong way you know so we have to be very careful someone hurts your feelings and then you use your tongue to strike back at them amen see a tongue is capable of showing your bad side or your good side However, when we are tempted to use our tongues in a very ungodly way, James tells us these words. He said, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. You know, it, it regards to how churchy that we may look or sound or dress up. But if we are not bridling our tongue, speaking the word that is well pleasing to God, then James, Jesus' half brother, who lived in the same residence with Jesus in Nazareth, say that our religion is worthless. So we want our religion to be worth something. We must, by all means, bridle and control our tongues. See, our tongues have a unique power and ability to help us as well as hurt us or hurt others. Because what we say and how we say it really matters. See, it used to be say, well, this is my mouth, do what I want to. It don't matter what, you know, I, this is my mouth. No, but see, God made us 
and its mouth. If we use this mouth in the wrong way, we are opposing God. So now we must take this tongue that God has given us as part of our human package, and we must use our tongue unselfishly. We must use our tongue carefully, and we must use our tongue beneficially. Amen. We're going to look at using our tongue unselfishly. James begins today's study by informing presumptuous teachers, those who want to be teachers and desire to be teachers. He says this. He said, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers. He said, not many of you. Many are called, but few are chosen. See, uh, teaching is a gift from God. We look at Ephesians 4, 11. Some are called to be preachers, pastors, and teachers, and some are called to be prophets and evangelists. But it's not something that we can just pick up and say, one day, I'm going to go and be a teacher. But many people want to be that teacher because teacher, teaching is a high-profile and visible profession. And many aspire to teachers, they desire the reputation of being a noted teacher and also see that teacher is front and center, amen, of audiences, small, medium, and large. See, in the fifth chapter of Matthew, they said when Jesus Christ had gone up on the mountain and the disciples already sitting there, he, he sat down, he opened his mouth and he began to teach. So all eyes were focused on Jesus. So in the Jewish world, they called the teacher rabbi. And many times the teacher, as he is walking down the street, people were following the rabbi, were following Jesus to hear what Jesus Christ said. See, Jesus was walking and teaching and healing all simultaneously. Amen, amen. The Jews believe the highest calling one can have is that of being a teacher. A rabbi. James said this about those aspiring to being a teacher. Matthew 23, 6, 7 say, They love the place of honor at feast and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace, being called rabbi by others. See, that, that makes a person feel real good to call rabbi. I know when I was teaching, they called me professor. So it made me feel real good being young and uh, in my early 20s. And here's a man, the three times he called me professor, Don. That made me feel very proud. But, uh, and, but see, many people want to be in that position, but that has to be a calling. We must use our tongues unselfishly. Being that the teacher's primary teaching medium and tool is, is verbal communication and speaking, it is very important for them to control their tongues. There are some few teachers who are guilty of promoting their own agendas and opinions so strongly, they become vessels of confusion. They become vessels of chaos. They become mediums of disputes and misinformation in a church. As, old, as some folks say, they get, become stuck on themselves. They become stuck on popularity. And they become being overly authoritative uh, figures. And, and nobody else's opinion or word has anything uh, worth ex they feel accept themselves. Called and saved spiritual leaders always teach those things which promote harmony, bringing people together rather than division. Uh, uh, gifted teachers and called teachers, amen, speak a word to unify people and, and, and love for one's fellow man. Peter says this, uh, amen, in First Peter 3, he said, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, Brother love. See, this is what teachers do when they use their tongues unselfishly. But the, the, the sole mission of using their tongue is to bless somebody and not to hurt somebody. James 
gives us a cautionary warning about being overly anxious to becoming a teacher. Because the teacher receives the greater condemnation when it comes to being judged by God. See, because as a teacher, we are teaching the word, so God holds the teacher to a higher standard because the teacher most likely is spending an inordinate and more time in the word and with God than the ones who are in his or her class and under their instructed and captive audience. So God holds teachers to a higher standard because teachers get that word first from God. Then see the teacher stands in between God and the ones they are teaching. And John 12, 48 says, everyone to whom much was given of him much will be required so it's more required of a teacher than it is of the pupils because pupils are learning and so they're going to make mistakes along the way but the teacher has spent a lot of time with god praying to god and preparing the word preparing the lessons they say and it goes on say and from him to whom they entrusted much they will demand more. See, God has put his word in the teacher's trust. So he demands more of the teacher than he does the student. Those who have been gifted and called by God to be teachers are held to a, a greater and higher standard, amen, of accountability, amen. Uh, for helping mature believers to grow and mature as future teachers. See, because people's futures, amen, are in the balance of the hand and the instruction of the teacher who are supposed to have a closer walk and relationship with God because without God, the teacher really does not have anything to say. Timothy says this about prematurely assigning a man new members as teachers who have not been sufficiently tried and tested. Timothy says this. He said, he said that teacher must not be a recent convert. Now one might come and 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 become a member of your church and be baptized and everything, and his profession might be that of a school teacher he might be a science teacher uh might be an english teacher or social studies teacher a language arts teacher but this does not necessarily qualify him or her to be an instructor in the word of god see this is a different dynamic when we are in the house of worship teaching god's word see because uh with the uh, out in the world secular world we can go to college and learn how to teach English, uh, to learn uh, how to teach math or science. But here in God's house, teaching there has to be a calling. And see, many of our teachers in God's house, the sanctuary, have no college degrees. Because, see, uh, being a, a, a called teacher of God is not predicated upon how many degrees and certifications we have, but it's based upon our calling and our commitment to God and how God wants to use us. See, the new convert and novice who's just coming into church, they might have gotten baptized one week and now we say, well, they are teaching over such and such school. Let's go on and make them a teacher. See, your teachers can't be made. Teachers have to be called by God. But Peter says, uh, Jesus told Peter this, and, and this uh, we can say it's about teachers. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. He is saying that Satan will make a play pretty our teacher who has not been called. See, Satan knows some scripture. Satan knows enough scripture 
to confuse that novice or that uncalled teacher. See, because Satan, when Jesus Christ had come out of the wilderness, after he had been baptized in the Jordan River, Satan challenged Jesus three times. He said, if you be the son of God, he said, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus Christ told Satan that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, Satan wanted to trick and trap Jesus, but he tempted him two more times. We're going to move on today. But we see Satan even challenges Jesus in the word, where Jesus Christ is the word, but Satan is bold. He even challenges the word. And even when over in Job, I, I think it was one, the verses 1 and 6, uh, 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 when the sons of God came to meet with God, uh, the Bible says Satan came also. And God asked Satan, what are you going? he said, I'm going to and fro and up and down. So Satan and the New Testament say he's going around like a roaring lion to see who he can devour. See, so Satan is going to check you out. Satan is going to test you in God's word. So we got to be very careful about who we uh, have as teachers in our Sunday schools and in our Bible study. See, because what they teach a line up in their weaker life when they are away from church. So if they live in a suspect life out in the world, then they should not in no means be up calling, trying to teach somebody God's word. Amen. Amen. Now we must use <clears throat> we must use our tongues carefully. We must use our tongues carefully. Taming your tongue. We must use our tongues very carefully. We cannot uh, go around talking loosely. Uh, we must lift people up. We must speak words to encourage people. So use your tongue very carefully. Because God blessed us with these tongues. Amen. The Apostle James writes this message in reference to the use or misuse of our tongues. He said, for in many things we all offend. So James said, every now and then we're going to use our tongue in the wrong way. So we must be aware of that. And we must, when we discover we used our tongue in the wrong way, we must immediately call on God, confess to him that we have used our tongue in the wrong way and, and, and pray to him that he'll clean us up. Just like David, when he realized he had gone against God and committed adultery and, and several other things, they created me a clean heart of God, renew within me a right spirit, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. We must ask God to restore us uh, based upon the time when he first called us to do whatever ministry he has called us to do. Uh, uh, see, he said, if any offend, offend means to trip and is a synonym for sin. Every now and then we offend and we get tripped up. We get tripped up by anger. We get tripped up when someone says something to offend us. We might get uh, tripped up when we are uh, at a party or something like that. We get tripped up many times so we must know how to get on our knees but see uh, 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 Paul tells us in Romans 3, 3 23 he said for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God so we are all guilty of sin none of us are perfect but we must know when to go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to forgive us for the sins that we unwillfully 
and unknowingly committed, if we discover that we have done wrong in the sight of God, then we must go to him in prayer. Now, see, there's an ageless proverb which states the quickest and surest way for one to cut his own throat is with his own tongue. You know, see, some folks have not given enough rope to hang himself. Look at the ways we can sin with our tongue. We just, just got to look at the way we can sin. See, the tongue can be used in so many in diverse ways. The tongue can be used to gossip. Amen. To put people's business all over the world. The tongue can be used to tell a lie. And today that seems in this present day culture, people don't care about people lying. See, we are in this present pandemic because of lying. People are dying right now as we speak because of lies. The tongue can be used to deceive and trick people. Tongue can be used for dishonesty. The tongue can be used to say many hateful things. The tongue can be used to express love. The tongue can be used to give encouragement. Moses comes along and he informs us of the serious misuse of tongue in these words. He said, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And we hear God's name being used in vain as we see text, we receive text on Instagram, we see uh, Twitter and these other venues of, amen, of uh, you know, social media, and we see one where OMG, oh my God, and we hear people using this God's name loosely. So, see, this is a vain use of God's word. The scripture said, God is not mocked. We must honor God with our whole body. We should not use any part of our body that God created us to be. Uh, you know, to uh, use his name vain. Because he's God all by himself. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. He is the first and last. And he is God all by himself. So we should not vainly and playfully use God's word in the wrong way. See, I think there's one uh, rapper calls himself Charlemagne the God. And I'm not talking about him, but he spells it. Uh, he, he, he spelled God with a capital G. So here he is putting himself on the same plane as God. See, that is dangerous. That is dangerous. But we're going to pray for such a uh, person himself. God, he's a good person. But we need to encourage him and show him a better way, a more perfect way, and, and introduce him to God's word. So so we, we pray that one day that will happen. And I I believe that, that that change is going to come. I believe it's going to come. We must use our tongues carefully. Don't World War II, uh, naval officers and captains on the ship uh, and caution their sailors to keep very quiet because the enemy had listening devices that were very sensitive and they were sent out wave signals and they could tell where the ships were by picking up a man noise on the ship. So on the ship, the sailors were encouraged to be quiet on the ship, to not even speak or say anything because they had a saying where it said, loose lips sink ships. Loose lips sink ships. And when used wrong, the tongue and lips can destroy lives. Many people's lives have been destroyed because of the tongue was used in the wrong way. There have been divorces and, and troubled marriages because of lies. Elias' lying lips were the cause of Emmett Till's 
lynching. A lady telling a lie called this young man to be lynched and murdered as a young boy, not quite in puberty because of lying lips. And America accepted this so much, the lady came back and recanted and Mississippi is not looking at convicting anything. So it was okay for that person to lie and for this young boy, 14 years old, to be murdered, brutally battered and murdered. And see, it, it's it, lying is seen to be a man, a culture today. Because they have comedy clubs, you know, joking is nothing but lying. But that's in, that's in a, another vein. Lying lips are the root cause of confusion in our nation's capital. Lying lips are the cause of confusion a man in our state capital. Lying lips was the cause of slavery. People lived on lie that God allowed them to enslave people and use them in evil ways. It was lying that caused the Native Americans who were already here before Christmas laws came that they was marched and we know, we know about the Trail of Tears where they were marched from their ancestral land and given some bad land in the state of Oklahoma. See, with lying lips, the reason why people came here, and there were millions of Native Americans here, but when these people came in with their infectious diseases, the Native Americans reduced down a man to less than 300,000 persons, in number in millions, because of lies. They are on reservations today in 2020. Lying lips were the cause of, root cause of David's fall from grace. Because he lied. He lied. He lied. He, he, he sent someone to get Bathsheba's wife when he had when he had slept with her so he could and he could tell you around the husband a lie but god convicted him that's why in psalm 51 things they created me a clean heart so he was convicted of his lie malicious gossip is a deadly misuse of the tongue it's a deadly use. see many christians now today in this social media culture uh, they have the cell phones, we have Twitter, we can text, and people are spending an ordinary amount of time on these gadgets gossiping about fellow church members and fellow saints and texting and tweeting and FaceTiming and all these other social media amen, uh, tools and sources of entertainment. Amen. King Solomon provides this word of caution. Sing King Solomon provides this word of caution to present day gospels. Proverbs 1 uh, 18 21 reads. The tongue has the power of life and death. The tongue has the power of life and death. That means we can encourage someone with our tongue or we can destroy one's character with our tongue. We can use our tongue in a very hurtful way. The tongue tame the untamed tongue can cause us to sin in countless ways. And James carried to another length when he said, we all stumble in many ways. We all stumble in many ways. James gives us this added admonishment as to the power of the tongue. James 3 2b reads 
anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Simply put, when we keep our tongue in check, our whole person and our whole body is in check. And those around us are happy, our families are happy when we keep our tongue in check, when we use our tongue to bless and praise God. Everybody is a beneficiary of us brightening our tongue. The ability to brighten the tongue is a sign of spiritual maturity for this reason. James 3, 2 says, C says, able to keep your whole body in check. So when we are not lying, we are keeping, the word of God is keeping our whole body in check. Taming your tongue. We must use our tongues beneficially. We must use our tongues beneficially. We must keep our tongues bridled. But a bridled tongue keeps our persons in control. It keeps us in check when we use our tongues to honor and glorify Almighty God. Amen. Amen. James probably used the metaphors of bits in horses' mouths and rudders on ships. What do bits and rudders have in common? These two entities give direction to things much larger than themselves. James uses these two analogies to demonstrate the power of the tongue. The rudder being small controls a man is a control a megaton warship the rudder being small controls a megaton warship see the captain's at that stern as he turned that little wheel and the rudder on this megaton ship a man is moving through the ocean and guys the ocean just that little rudder is a small thing, but it controls something that are megatons heavier than it is. Amen. 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 The bridle weighing less than five pounds controls a thousand plus pound horse, mule, or camel. See, without a bridle, the mule horse or camel is really out of control. But that bridle is very small. And the bit in the horse's and camel and mule's mouth with that bridle, we can control what the horse does, when the horse moves, when the horse stops. Amen. When you control your when you control your tongue, you control your entire body. Controlled tongues is our protection against lying and profanity. Controlled tongues is our protection against lying and profanity. That means we, we call it cussing. See, when a person, we say curse, but we could, we call it cussing. But when we do that, for momentarily, we feel bad. Because, you know, we're going against God when we use profanity. And it's not a, a good thing when we use profanity. I was saying in the hood, call it cussing. 
David give us this word of caution and encouragement. In Psalm 32, 9, he said, Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and brow, or they will not come to you. So see, horses are beautiful animals, mules are beautiful animals, but without a bit or brow, they are totally out of control. They're not going to come to you all right. They're not going to respond to you to do this or do that without the bit or the bridle because the bit in the horse's amused mouth puts a little pressure on their mouth and, and they are not turning because they want to turn, but they're, they're turning because what the bridle, the, the bridle what gives a little, make the mouth uncomfortable. They're, they're turned to not be uncomfortable. They're not doing it for you. They're doing what to not feel uncomfortable. You see, the horse always wants to run away. The horse has an innate instinct to run away. If you open the gate up to the stable, the horse is going to run away. I don't care how much you feed the horse, how much you groom the horse. That gate open, the horse is always looking for an opportunity to run away. The horse does not want to be controlled. He wants to be totally free. Now the mule on the other hand is lazy. The mule is stubborn. Even sometimes when you got the bit and bridle in the mule's mouth, the mule just gonna sit down and lay down. Cause folks said that boy is stubborn as a donkey. See, you could threaten the dunk and not feed the dunk and the mule going to just sit down and say, I ain't going to do nothing today because I don't feel like it. If you want this field plowed, go plow it yourself. That's the attitude that the mule and the dunk have. The Lord does not desire to bridle our tongue. The Lord wants us to use our tongue, amen, as living sacrifices. He wants to use our tongues to sing praises to him. The Lord wants to use our tongues to offer up prayers and make prayers. God wants us to use our tongue to encourage brothers and sisters. Amen. God wants us to use our tongue to lift up Jesus. He wants us to use our tongues to teach Sunday school, to sing in the choir. He wants to use our tongues, as I say again, being over repetitive, to honor him. Romans 12, 1, uh, Paul brings this point home when he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. How are we going to present it? Holy and make sure it's unacceptable to God. So which is our spiritual worship. So present, giving ourselves back to God is God worship. Using our tongues to honor God is God worship. Anything that we do to honor God is God worship. Amen. We then we will we, we then will and say only what the Lord speaks through our souls. See, when we, when we are saved, we're going to speak what God, amen, uh, uh, wants us to speak. And he uses our tongue to do that. Paul said this about the uh, godly use of our tongue. In Ephesians 4.29, he goes on to say, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. He's saying what? Use your tongue in a godly way. Anything that's bad, don't let it be a part of your person. Anything that you think, if you think it, don't speak it. Amen. Pray to God and ask God to move that bad thought or idea out of your person and out of your soul. We should not utter anything bad that is harmful and hurtful to others. We should only use our tongue to encourage and edify or to lift people, to encourage people, to, to have to, people can have this say, good morning, good evening, how you doing today? Use our tongue to encourage and edify folks. 
Paul states, only the following should be spoken with our tongues, but only such as good for building up. If what we're saying not building up somebody, then we really should not be saying it. If you're not building somebody up, we should not be saying it. We must use our tongues beneficially. Use our tongues beneficially. Amen. Just like a ship is being controlled by a small rudder, we uh, should let the word of God be the rudder. Amen. For our tongue to control our tongue. Amen. Like a horse without a bridle, an untamed tongue means our entire life is out of control. James puts forth this scripture to illustrate the power of the tongue. He said, James 3, 4, he said, look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs such a small thing if you look at the pilot's wheel in a huge ship many times it's smaller than the steering wheel in your car but it is attached to a rudder that is controlling a megaton ship that has megatons, a man, of supplies and goods that are to be delivered and picked up, but being controlled by a small rudder. You see, a man, a slight move of the ship's helm or rudder was changed and affect the course of the ship, that it will reach its charted course and destination just with that small rudder without that rudder functioning that ship is out of control at sea when we control our tongues the person our group speaking negative about us amen see the control of our tongue will keep our mind stayed on jesus when we're someone saying something bad about us we won't start cursing and screaming. We will, by the hand of God, control our tongues by keeping our eyes stayed on Jesus. Isn't that powerful? That is so when we keep our eyes stayed on Jesus. Sun, it's sunrise. Keep your eyes stayed on Jesus. Keep our eyes stayed on the Lord. To control our tongues in different situations, David speaks this word for us to keep our tongues under control in difficult and trying situations. He says this, Psalm 39, when he said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. He said, I'm going to protect my person. You know, I'm going to tap into that Jesus that's inside of me. Because the word said, great is he who is in you than he who is in the world. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle. The word of God is our muzzle. So long as the wicked are in my presence. So David was saying, long as wicked folks and crazy folks around me, I'm going to control my tongue. I'm going to tap into the word of God that the Holy Spirit control my tongue. Bringing our tongues, browning our tongues will spare us a lifetime of anger and confusion. The helmsman can carefully steer his ship, keeping it on course, or he can be careless, causing it to wreck and, and many passages and sailors dying. Likewise, we can make careless and pain, painful statements, wrecking reputation we can make careless statements what uh destroying marriages 
we can lose loose lips a man compromising our spiritual witness Due to the power of the human tongue, Jesus gives us this warning. On the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. So what is saying, my brothers and sisters? It's saying that when we stand before God's judgment seat, all of this is going to come up. Every bad deed or every good deed is going to come up. Because the Bible said we must all come before the judgment seat of God. So we're going to have to give an account of the good use of our tongue or the misuse of our tongue. James ends today's message on this positive word of encouragement. James 3, 5 reads, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. So when the tongue is under control, uh, it boasts a great thing. Uh, a tongue and control can make some great things happen. See, a tongue that's under control, a man can head up a family. A tongue that's under control uh, will speak words and encouragement to the wife, the wife to the husband. A tongue that's under control will encourage his or uh, her children. When the scripture says, provoke not your children to rest. See, that tongue when used in a godly way, is a powerful tool in this world. See, the tongue can provide comfort and build up. The tongue can teach God's word. The tongue can express love and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Allow me to take this opportunity to invite someone to come to Jesus. This is an invitation to Christian discipleship. To encourage all saved Christians in this Bible, we're going to challenge you in the study group, as well as members of our home house of worship, to allow God to use a man of the tongue. He has blessed you to have to encourage that on the fence, uh, encourage those who are on the fence of being a man, unsaved Christians, a man, to encourage him or her, to give them encouragement. Some might be on the fence. At one time, we were on the fence of being unsaved Christians. But we want to encourage them today that all is not over. All is not over. And we can be saved. They can be saved right now. Some of us in the Bible study might not be saved. But see, it's a very simple thing that we could do. We could pray. And we can confess with our mouth, Lord Jesus, and believe in our heart, God raised him from the dead, then they too will be saved. So we want to encourage others to tell God that they believe in Jesus. Have that talk with God. Show them how to pray. Because some people say, some don't know how to pray for themselves. But we could take this opportunity as Jesus Christ says, the Lord teach us how to pray. As John taught his disciples how to pray. And we could take them off to even teach them that moment how to pray. And teach them how to confess, tell God all about their troubles. And God will do the rest. And the Bible said when they've done this, they too will be saved. If you are that one person right now, we invite you and encourage you right now to accept Jesus as your Lord, Savior, and Master. You're not here with me right now, but you could call me at China Grove Baptist Church or contact some member of China Grove. Or you might just contact a peach uh, Preach or pastor anywhere and tell them that the Holy Spirit has moved you to becoming a saved Christian as opposed to being an unsaved Christian, wherever they are. God will accept you as a new convert. 
if you're here today, you hear his voice, hard not your heart, I want to encourage you right now. Let us pray, Father, now, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for this present Bible study. And we pray that someone has been touched today. Someone has been enriched, Father. We thank you. It's all not because of teaching. It's because Jesus is your word. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters who have been impacted in such a monumental way by this COVID-19. Uh, uh, we pray for those who have empty seats at their dinner tables because of this COVID-19. We pray for those who lost that mother or father because of this COVID-19. We pray that you will give them comfort right now. Lord, we pray for the leaders who are negligent in carrying out their duties to save countless lives. We know that you could have stopped, Lord, but Scripture tells us, Paul said, all things work together, Lord, to the good of those who love you. Lord, so we love you. And we are not going to speak evil of any man. Because you told us to love those who don't love us. Father, we bless you. And Father, we praise you. And we lift your Lord. We ask you to be with us and guide us until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen.